I just, before I get started, I just want to say, it's a good thing that we as a church understand the need for the gospel to go forward to every nation on earth. I know for me personally, sometimes I get caught up with the things that are going on in my life, and and it's just real, and that's important, and those are things that we should be concerned about, and we should devote ourselves to pursuing holiness and righteousness and unity within our fellowship, but may we never, ever, ever be a people that forget there are billions across the world who do not know Jesus, and we have the gospel. I'm grateful to be part of a church that holds high the gospel, not just here in Rock Hill, but around this state, around this nation, and around this world. But may it never stop, and may we, as we're talking about tonight, never be content with what we've done. May there be a holy discontentment in our heart that there are thousands of people that are not worshiping Jesus right now, and that are worshiping themselves, or worshiping statues, or worshiping false things that bring them no hope. The Lord just stirred my heart as I was watching that video to think, may we never be content with that. I'm going to pray, because uh, I don't know how to transition to what I'm going to talk into after what I just said that, so the best way is let's just go before the Lord. <laughs> go. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for the hope of the gospel. Thank you for the privilege that we have of being a people that can hold it high. Lord, I thank you that on Wednesday nights there are just numerous accounts of how we've had the opportunity to share the gospel. And I pray, Lord, that we would not feel like there's some kind of dichotomy between holding the gospel high in Rock Hill and holding it high all across the world, but that, Lord, we would be a people who have a burden for our neighbors and who have a burden for the lost, no matter where they might be. So, Father, if we can go, we pray that you would send us. If we can't go, we pray that you would make us senders, but that in every way we would be diligent and we would seek for people to know and love and follow you. Father, we are grateful and we thank you and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think I had that mic pack in my back pocket, so it's probably causing some of the distortion issues, so I'm going to try to fix it. All right, we better, Brian? All right. I want to say a huge thank you to the sound and tech guys up there. They usually get the short end of the stick when something goes wrong because people think it's their problem when it's usually the preacher. So, all right, so this, uh, this evening we are going to be talking about the idea of contentment. Uh, if you want to go ahead and open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, we'll be there in just a few minutes. Um, really kind of some, uh, some things before we get started. In the early 1900s, John D. Rockefeller was the richest man in America. His wealth was anywhere between 1% to 1.5% of the entire American economy. You get the entire economy of a country, he had 1% to 1.5% of it. In fact, if you were to kind of put it in today's term, that would be roughly $340 billion. That is three times almost the amount of money that Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon, the richest man in the world, has right now. And so if we want to put this into perspective, when he was 16, his goal in life was to make $100,000 and to live to be 100 years old. Yet later in life, when he was asked how much money is enough, it is claimed that what he said was just a little bit more. $340 $340 billion. How much money is enough? Well, just a little bit more. Now, my guess is that if we were to kind of ask most of us, many of us in this room, if we said if we got that $100,000, we would be satisfied. Or maybe there's some of you in here who've seen $100,000 and you say, well, not quite. You need just a little bit more. But maybe it's not the money. Maybe it's the spouse. Maybe it's a promotion, maybe it's the house, maybe it's the car, maybe it's the status, maybe it's the position. What if we never get those? The thing is, we know the right answer. We know what we're supposed to say. Our satisfaction isn't in things, we need to be content in the Lord. We know that, we can say that. But the question I have, starting with myself 
And to put before you is do we really live like that? Do we really believe that? And unfortunately, there are times that our hearts are so fickle that we will know the right thing to say, that we'll know that our contentment should only be found in the Lord, and yet we find ourselves seeking, finding, or living, either being content in the things of the world or being discontent where God has put us right now. You see, it's a razor-thin line between being discontent with the Lord and being content with things that take our eyes off of Him. What if we never get those? Or what if when we get them like Rockefeller, we really just aren't satisfied? So we're going to look at this idea of contentment, and what we're going to do is we're going to spend our first part of time in the Word, unpacking a passage that teaches us about contentment. And then like Pastor Dave did on his message about anger, we're just going to talk about the idea of contentment, and I want to put before you some things that I've learned from a man who lived a long time ago and could teach us a lot about being content. Those of you who know me, it is not Spurgeon, although probably could get some really awesome stuff from Spurgeon. Spurgeon thought this guy was great, so ergo, he's really good. Um, We're going to look at a passage that contains a text that's going to be common to you. That verse is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, this is one of those verses that just gets people pumped up. You know, I can do, I remember, I remember as a high schooler, you guys, some of you may remember this, you may not, but like, um, youth ministry in the 90s was all about the big wow factor thing. Um, and they had this group called the Power Team. And I don't know if you ever saw the Power Team, but they were like weightlifters for Jesus. And the, yeah, I see some nods out there like, yeah, Power Team, that's right. I mean, they would come into schools and they would do these feats of strength. Like one guy would rip telephone books in half. Another guy had a giant log that was that had two handles on it and he would pick it up and put it over his head. Another guy would break baseball bats across his leg. And the thing that I remember is it was Philippians 4.13. My question is, is that what Paul's talking about? Paul's like, I can break this baseball bat. Boom! Woo! Philippians 4.13. Or is it passing a physics exam? Or is it learning to drive a stick shift? The reason why I ask that is because this verse in particular is used in those kind of circumstances. But put yourself in the baseball game. What if the pitcher on the mound is quoting Philippians 4.13 as the batter in the batting box is quoting Philippians 4.13? So at that point in time, he will get struck out while hitting a home run (laughs) because they can do all things. Or what if you haven't studied enough for physics? You can fail through Jesus. Or what if it has nothing to do with this at all? My biggest question is, what is the all things that Paul is talking about in this verse? And it's the reason why you think, okay, why those, if we're talking about discontentment, why are we talking about those things? It's because it's the all things that get us to understand this idea of contentment. So we're going to dive in and we're going to see what this is really all about. So the first thing we always have to keep in mind when we consider trying to understand the meaning of a text is that we have to understand the context in which it's found. So if you pull a verse out of context, you can make it say anything. You can make Paul talk about lifting logs over your head because you can pull it out of its context. Now, I don't want to, I'm not trying to just crack down on the power team. I think they had a right idea. They wanted people to know Jesus. But I think like a lot of them, we can take something and turn it. And really, while we think we're using a verse for its power, we can rob it of the power the Spirit has there. Because this is about something so much deeper that we all need to understand. So when we keep our eye on the context, we keep in mind the immediate context. If I'm looking at Philippians 4, I want to look in the chapter. I want to look in the entire book as well. So in this case, we're going to look at the verses before But then we're also going to understand what the book of Philippians is about. So just because I'm not sure if all of you know all the context of the book of Philippians, let's back up just a little bit. Philippians is a letter to a church in a place called Philippi written by the Apostle Paul. So Paul started the church in Philippi. And if you remember in the book of Acts, Paul was trying to go one direction and he had a dream. It was a man from Macedonia and says, hey, come talk to us. So he goes over there and he starts the church in Philippi and then he moves on. And so he's writing this letter from prison in Rome, and in many ways, it's a, it's a thank you note. 
surely a, a thank you note to the Philippians, but more importantly, it's a letter thanking God for all he is and for all he's done for us. So Paul's words here in the book of Philippians are ultimately, first and foremost, a thank you to God and a thank you to them. So the decisive term we see is in verse 10. So let's read the passage tonight. We're going to read verses 10 through 13. It'll be our time in the text. And in verse 10, there's a, there's a change because in verses 8 through 9 are kind of like a summary of what the entire book is about. And then we get to verse 10. Paul writes this, Philippians 4, starting in verse 10. I rejoice in the Lord greatly. Now at length, you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You see, Paul writes that he's rejoiced that they have revived their concern for him. And so this concern, this is the whole reason for the letter of thanks. The Philippians had sent a financial gift to Paul in the midst of his trouble. And though he's in prison, the people who had traveled with him were able to help care and provide for him. But then he does something weird. It almost seems like it's a sidestep. Do you see this? He says, you, you, you've revived your concern. I mean, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity. And when I first read that, I was like, man, Paul, what's going on? Is this like, I want to thank you, but I don't really want to thank you? Like, I don't want you to get the big head? Is that what he's doing? I think what Paul is doing here is actually helping to keep the focus where it needs to be. Not so much on the Philippians and not so much on the gift, but on the Lord. You've revived your concern for me. Not that it ever went away. There wasn't an opportunity. Why was there an opportunity? Because the Lord has put me where he's put me. In fact, if you go back to Philippians chapter 1, he says there's the whole reason why he's there is to be a mouthpiece for the gospel. In fact, Caesar's household has actually heard the name of Jesus because he's in jail. I've heard it said before, Paul had, had a guard chained to him at all times. So can you imagine? You're chained to the Apostle Paul. You're going to hear about Jesus. And if it's the elite guard, the elite guards are going to hear about Jesus, everybody who's there. So Paul, in this circumstance, in jail, is saying, man, this is fantastic. It's turned out and opened up an opportunity for me to share the gospel. And so the question is, why can Paul be so content in such a bad situation. Really, he says it right here. He says, I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You see, Paul's contentment wasn't based on his circumstances. That's why he could say, in any circumstance. Because if our contentment is based on our circumstances, then we're going to be content, discontent, happy, unhappy, want, need, whatever, because we don't have enough to satisfy. But Paul also said that he knows how and he has learned. Contentment doesn't come naturally. We are not naturally content. We want more. Or we want different. And Paul learned. He learned the secret. How to be brought low. How to abound. How to face plenty. How to face hunger. How to face abundance. And how to face need. It's interesting we think about this. We think about being brought low and facing hunger, hunger and facing need as something we need to learn how to do. How many of us think about the fact that we need to learn how to face abundance. We need to learn how to face plenty. And we need to learn how to face when things are going really well. We don't think we need to. We think we got that. It's the hard parts. But Paul said he had even learned how to face the good times and still glorify Jesus. The problem for many of us is we will not glorify Jesus when things are going good because we feel satisfied and content in ourselves, as if we can make everything happen. 
But Paul said, I have learned both circumstances and I've learned it in Christ. I can do this through Christ. He can keep my mind focused and glorifying God when things are plenty and he can keep my mind focused and glorifying God when things are bad. That's the secret of his contentment. So in the original context, Paul writes that all things in facing need and plenty, danger, safety, good times, and bad times, the strength we find in Christ is the strength to be content in Him no matter what our circumstances may be. So here is the question that's before us tonight. What is contentment? What is contentment? How do we define it? How do we understand what it is? I've been talking about it as if we're, we're all on the same page, but maybe we should kind of dive into that just a little bit. Jerry Bridges uh, is one of, my, one of my favorite authors. He wrote a book called The Practice of Godliness, which um, is one of my all-time favorites. And in that, he's going through, he's going through just characteristics of what it means to be a godly person. And one of those characteristics is contentment. And Bridges writes this, contentment is one of the most distinguishing traits of the godly person because a godly person has his heart focused on God rather than on possessions or position or power. So what does it mean? Well, I'd like to introduce you to a man named Jeremiah Burroughs. Burroughs, he was an English pastor in the 1600s, and he was forced out of England for not teaching the way the Church of England wanted him to teach. He was a nonconformist. And he was a Puritan pastor. And Burroughs preached the gospel. And because of that, he was pushed out of England. And he was pushed to an interesting place that some of us have now begun to hold dear, a city called Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And he pastored the English-speaking church in Rotterdam. And was there for many years. And then when things changed in England, he came back and was used of God to help make changes there. And then two years after his death, a book was published by him entitled The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. So as we're going to look deeper into this idea of what is contentment, what does it look like to be discontent, how do we fight discontentment, I'm going to draw heavily on Burroughs, and I'm going to give you several, several quotes from him that I was looking through as I was preparing for this. I was like, oh, that one's good. Oh, that one's good. And I just had to quit. And I was like, okay, I'm not just going to stand up here and read his book to everybody. Um, <laughs> although it's really good. All right. But uh, so here's, here's what we have. Burroughs defines contentment as this. Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposition in every condition. Now, that's a good Puritan definition because it's got a whole lot of words in it and it says a lot of things. Let's go through it real quickly again. Christian contentment is a sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit. So it's an internal feeling, an internal disposition, which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposition in every condition. So it's an internal sense of spirit that recognize that God is wise and our loving Father in every condition that we're in. Because the danger we face is both discontentment with God and the flip side of that is contentment with the world. But contentment keeps our eyes focused on Him. You see, as I've already mentioned, this is a satisfaction and a rest that is not based on our circumstances. So, in other words, to be content if our circumstances are bad is learning to let our rest and joy be in Jesus and not in the things or the situation. All of this is an act of God's grace. But if our circumstances are good, the problem with good circumstances, we get so content with things that we don't feel like we need God. We get content in things that can go away in the blink of an eye. And Paul learns not to be content in things, but in Jesus. One of the things I've come to understand as I've studied this more is that discontentment is ultimately ingratitude. Discontentment is ultimately ingratitude towards God. It's a saying 
that Burroughs points out that we are often discontent because God doesn't provide something he never promised to provide. We're ungrateful for what God has given us, and then we are ungrateful because he hasn't given us something that in our mind we've made up that he should give us, but he never said he would give it to us in the first place. Oftentimes, that is the root of our discontentment. Battery may have just died. Oh, did it come back on? Are we good? All right. If it cuts out again, we on the pulpit mic? All right. There we go. I take this thing off my ears then. All right. So the question is then, how do we do this? How do we fight against discontentment? And how do we find rest and satisfaction in God? You know, the thing is, when we start thinking about this, it's really an un-American thing to fight discontentment. I mean, it's ingrained in us that we can always have more and deserve more, and that if we just work a little harder, we too can have the American dream. I mean, y'all live in Rock Hill. How many mini storages do we have around this town? Every time we get one, they put another one up. And it seems to me they don't have a problem filling them. Now, if you've got a mini storage, I'm not, I'm not saying you're sinful, okay, so don't, don't go there. But the thing is, in America, we just think more is better. Bigger is better. Not just in Texas. All of us. We want bigger. We want better. We want newer. And everything in our culture is set towards feeding that discontentment. You see, our culture doesn't make us discontent. It actually just feeds it. Every little piece of marketing is set to tell us we deserve it, we need it, and we should get more and more. Everything from power tools to soap to clothing brands or chewing gum is meant to make you think you're lacking something. But if you get this, you'll be complete. Right? The 55-inch TV used to be the massive, uh uh-uh. Samsung QLED, the football player, will just run right through it into your living room. It'll be so amazing. But as soon as you get that, give it two years, and Samsung will be telling you to throw that piece of trash out because you need the 74,000-inch one that just fills up the entire side of your house, right? I mean, we joke, but every single commercial, soft drinks, you know? I said power tools first because I love power tools. And I see the commercial, and I'm like, I need one of those. And I think need is the proper term, not want. I think need. But that's what it's set up. Everything is in there. And again, it's our culture doesn't make us discontent. It just feeds on the natural longings that are already there. And unfortunately, a lot of times we as believers just are even unaware of it and buy right into it. And we don't understand that it is a battle for our souls. Because when we find our contentment in the right soap, in the right body image, in the right house, in the right possessions, we say, I'm good, Jesus. I got all this stuff. We never want to be those people. We want to say, no matter the stuff, I've got Jesus. And that's the battle that's on our hands. Burroughs says this about things. My brethren, the reason why you have not got contentment in the things of the world is not because you have not got enough of them. That is not the reason But the reason is because they are not things proportional to that immortal soul of yours that is capable of God himself. It's as C.S. Lewis says, it's not as though God defines our desires too weak. He finds them too small. We are satisfied when things when we could have God himself. Burroughs also reminds us that we don't find contentment by adding to our wants but by subtracting from our desires. He writes this, The way of contentment to a carnal heart, that is, one is not following after God, is only removing of the affliction. Oh, that it may be gone. No, says a gracious heart. 
God has taught me a way to be content through the affliction itself, though the affliction itself continues. There is a power of grace to turn this affliction into good. It takes away the sting and the poison of it. You see, when we are going through times of affliction, or we are even going through times of abundance, or we're going through a time when we understand that there may be some discontent in our hearts, we have to say, what is it that we are seeking, wanting, or think that we need? What is causing the envy, the overworking, the stress? What is it that we're daydreaming about? What is it that we feel like if I just had this, everything would be good? And if we will take the time and examine those things in our own hearts, what we will find is that we will be able to see the root of the discontentment. We have to study our own hearts. And the way that we fight discontentment boils down to an understanding of God's grace. So if we are a Christian, we understand that whatever our situation may be, it is better than we deserve. Now, I don't, I'm not a huge Dave Ramsey fan, but anybody, if you ever listen to Dave Ramsey, somebody will call in to him and say, Dave, how you doing? Better than I deserve. That's, well, you know, it may be something he just says. But that is the reality for every single one of us. Because of Christ's death, we receive life. We deserve separation from God. Our sin, rightfully, the wages of it is death. But our God is so good and so full of grace that he gives us what we do not deserve. Yes, eternal life. Yes, the hope of heaven. He gives us himself. We have him. And it's so much more than we deserve. And I love Ephesians 2, 7. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Y'all, we're just getting a foretaste right now. We're not even going to be able to imagine. God is so full of grace and so full of kindness that it's going to take and an infinite eternity to begin to show us how wonderful he is. The treasure trove of grace that he has for us. It will take forever and we will never exhaust it. And we'll never get tired of it. I remember as a kid sometimes thinking, man, when I get to heaven, won't I get tired of singing the songs? Or won't I get tired? Maybe, maybe I get bored a little bit. But when you understand the magnitude of who Jesus is and you understand there's no boredom because it's amazing forever. You see, we understand that for all of eternity, God will lavish on us the grace and kindness of Christ. Knowing this allows us to keep the right perspective. Again, Burroughs writes this. What do you think there's no, there's no way for the contentment of your spirit but to get rid of your burden? Oh, you are deceived. The way of contentment is to add another burden. That is to labor to load and burden your heart with your sin. The heavier the burden of your sin is to your heart, the lighter will be the burden of your affliction be to your heart. And so you shall come to be content. At the same time, we know that the Holy Spirit helps us to do this. Ephesians 1.13, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. When we come to Christ and we're filled with the Spirit who empowers us to do this, that's why Paul can say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He can face the hard times and the good times in a way that honors Jesus because he's sealed with the Spirit and the Spirit empowers him to do it. The grace of Christ is greater than the worst things we encounter and the best things in life. Burroughs writes this, 
While I live in the world, my condition is to be but a pilgrim, a stranger, a traveler, and a soldier. Now, rightly to understand this, not only being taught it by rote so that I can speak the words, but when my soul is possessed with the consideration of this truth, that God has set me in this world, not as in my home, but as a mere stranger and a pilgrim who is traveling to another home, and that I am here as a soldier in my warfare, I say a right understanding of this is a mighty help to contentment in whatever may befall me. These are the thoughts of someone who's learned contentment. I was thinking about this even this morning when I was reading a passage uh, in my, my daily Bible reading. Uh, I'm reading through 1 Peter right now. And in 1 Peter 2, Peter says something interesting. He's going through and he's, he's been talking about authority and submitting to authority in our lives. And the interesting thing that I found as I was studying this is he's talking about, not right in this section, about authority within the church or even godly authority. He's talking about being subject to human institutions. The emperor, who was an ungodly pagan, or to the governors that were sent by him, most of which were ungodly pagans. And he's telling them to submit to their authority. And the whole reason why is that the gospel would go forth. And then he gets to verse 18 when he talks about servants. Be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. And then he writes something that just slapped me across the face this morning. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. It's a gracious thing. What does that mean? That we're, we're just being gracious? Quite literally, the Greek translation, this is a grace thing. It's a grace thing. It's actually a gift of God for us in our sanctification. Now, I don't know about y'all, but there's some gifts that I want to return and I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, Lord, is this a gift? And God is good and he is wise. And sometimes our difficulty is just the gift we need that he is going to use to sanctify us to be more like Jesus. You see, because this is a grace thing from God, but it's also a grace thing for us to demonstrate that we have received the grace of God. Because our home is not in this world and the way that we would respond naturally is not the way we respond because we've been changed by Jesus and our hope is in this world. And he goes on to say this again in verse 20. For what credit is when you suffer, what credit is if when you sin and are beaten for it you endure? Like you deserve that. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. This is a grace thing. We learn contentment sometimes in the midst of the difficulty, not by being taken out of the difficulty. I was going to... All right. Here's another place. I'm not going to go all deep into it. Just looked at the clock. We only got five minutes. I'm going to get you out of here on time. Okay? 1 Corinthians 7. Paul writes to people who are slaves. And he says, wherever you were when you got saved, stay there. If you can get your freedom, get it. But if not, stay there. Why? The whole point of it is you have Jesus. So even if you have nothing in this world, you have Jesus. And with that, you have everything. So some closing thoughts. The kind of the, what do we do with this? First thing is this, contentment is not laziness. There's a danger in talking about contentment that it could be a cover for laziness. Uh, you know, I'm just content with the Lord. I'm saved. I'm good. We are to press on with things. There is a certain holy discontentment with remaining sin in our life and a lack of holiness and a holy discontentment that there are people all around the world and across the street who've never heard the name of Jesus. That's a good discontentment. Let it never be a cover for laziness. We also must remember that contentment is a matter of perspective. Those who have been changed by Jesus will always work diligently for his glory. Next thing is this. Distraction is not contentment. 
Burroughs says something about this, which I think is helpful. If you come, bring some great thing to please us, perhaps it will quiet us and we will be contented. It is the thing you bring that quiets us, not the disposition of our own spirits, not any good temper in our own hearts, but the external thing you bring us. But when a Christian is content in the right way, the quiet comes more from the temper and disposition of his own heart than from any external argument or from the possession of anything in the world. You see, Jesus changes our attitude towards things. Burroughs writes, A gracious heart finds contentment in this. If I have it, and I have a sanctified use of it too, I find God goes along with what I have to draw my heart nearer to Him and to sanctify my heart to Him. If I find my heart drawn nearer to God by what I enjoy, it is that much more that I have it. It is that much more than if I have it without any sanctifying of my heart by it. So that is a good reminder. Because sometimes we hear a sermon on, on, on contentment. Don't be content with the things of the world. And we think, okay, that means I need to go throw away all the stuff that I enjoy. Here's the question. Do you recognize the thing you enjoy as a gift of God? And does it turn your eyes to Him? Or does it turn your eyes inward? If it turns your eyes to Him, it is a double blessing. Because not only do you enjoy it, but you enjoy God more because of it. Next thing is this. Jesus may empower you to do great things. Philippians 4, 13. But remember, you can lose in a Christ-honoring way, and that is a big sign of being content in Christ. God is more concerned with your character and your heart than he is whether or not you perform well in an athletic, musical, or scholastic setting, or whether you get the promotion, or you live in a bigger house, or if you live in a smaller house. We must all examine our hearts and ask where our contentment lies. If you think your contentment lies in something other than God, ask yourself this question. Would your world completely collapse if it was taken from you? That's how you know your contentment is something which cannot ultimately satisfy. The last thing is this. The cross stands in front of us as a continual reminder that God wants our best. If we go back to the definition of contentment, it was that disposition, that sweet spirit of recognizing no matter what the circumstance, God is wise and is has fatherly love towards us. I want to say that sometimes a danger in talking about this is it can feel like the person who's up here is talking to you in the midst of a difficult situation and is just telling you you're just being ungodly and you just need to stop. And if you were really spiritual, you would just be content. My goal is not to make you feel bad. But what my goal is to say is when that real thing happens, when it is hard and you're wrestling on whether or not you are content with the Lord and what the Lord has for you, will you turn your eyes to the cross? Because it is at the cross where we can no longer doubt God is for our good. Because as I said earlier, we all deserve to be separated from God for eternity because of the sin which we have willingly committed. And yet Christ willingly gave himself for us, bore the wrath of God in our place that we could be with him and have him forever. That is the hope of the gospel. So no matter what you are going through, do not doubt the love of God for you. He has displayed it perfectly. For God has demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8 and in Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him give us all good things? The Lord 
loves you. And sometimes he will bring you through circumstances, allow circumstances, be a part of whatever's going on in your life, maybe to uproot some type of discontentment or contentment with the world and say you're settling for something lesser and I have so much more for you. I want to end with one more quote from Burroughs. Christian, how do you enjoy comfort before? Was the creature anything to you but a conduit, a pipe that conveyed God's goodness to you? The pipe is cut off, says God. Come to the fountain and drink immediately. Though the beams are taken away, yet the sun remains the same in the firmament as it ever was. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the hope of your word. Thank you that you are all sufficient and all good and all satisfying. Father, I confess that even as I was asked to preach on this, there are things in my life in which I am discontent with and I find my contentment in other ways. Father, I ask for your forgiveness for that. I pray that as a people, as a church, as a family, that we would be content only in you. And we would not find our contentment in things that will not satisfy. Lord, give us that quiet, inner, gracious spirit that even in the most difficult of circumstances, we can trust you. Grant us faith, we pray, for the name and glory of Jesus. Amen.